morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning here at Westside Baptist Church. We also welcome those who join us on our live feed. Um, I do just want to highlight a few announcements that are in the uh, news and the pews in your bulletin that you got handed this morning. Um, the pie fundraiser, there's a note about the last day to order. Uh, is Monday the 18th, which is tomorrow. Uh, we also want to, uh, Colleen wants to meet with the youth down here after church who are helping with that, so uh, we can kind of get our uh, schedule set so we know what everybody's going to be doing and where they need to be. Uh, also, this is the uh, last Sunday before our um, stewardship celebration luncheon, so if you have not indicated on the registration pad the past few weeks that you will be here, and, not be here. And, or not be here, and you plan to be here, make sure you note that when you sign the registration pad and you pass that down the road. So if you haven't done that, uh, please do that also. Um, still looking for uh, Christmas ornaments and donations there in the box, the white box down here. Uh, Let's see, there are, uh, I gotcha, I gotcha, I got a lot of stuff here. Okay, www, the Thanksgiving dinner, we're inviting everybody. If you don't uh, help with Wednesday night, but you would like to come, we would love to have you. Um, we're having the uh, traditional turkey dinner, so if you would like to join us, dinner starts at 5.30. So uh, that's just an invite to the, the whole church. Uh, Hanging of the Greens uh, is coming up Saturday, November 30th, so that's at 9 a.m. I don't hear anybody else saying anything else. There's a lot of information in here today, so uh, please go ahead and read that. Don Johnson has an announcement. Go ahead, Don. Yeah. There will be a missions committee meeting this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Okay. A mission committee meeting at 2 this afternoon. And Pastor Ryan. If you open up your bulletin, you will see that during the part of the service is a time of thankful sharing. Uh, this is Thanksgiving Sunday. I know it doesn't arrive immediately before Thanksgiving, but we are going to give a time for you to stand and share one or two words of thankful praise to the Lord, and just think about something that you are truly thankful for this year, and then we are going to tell God all about it in our worship service. So I wanted to give you that heads up so you can start thinking of one or two things that you would like to share about Thanksgiving. Okay, if, you don't have, if we don't have any other announcements, but I don't see anybody giving me a sign, why don't we get up and greet one another, and if you don't know somebody, introduce yourself.
let's begin. Amen? Amen. Because it seems like it came early this year. Let us use Psalm 107, a psalm that is on our signboard outside and you have driven by, reminding us that we are to be people of thanksgiving. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands. From the east and from the west. From the north and from the south. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wonderful works in humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you have once again filled our hearts, our bellies, our minds with good things. You have given us your spirit. You have given us the fruit of the earth and the fruit of the vine. And you have given to us your holy word. Lord, we give you thanks that we can be here to rejoice with all of humanity, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every language, that, Lord, your church might give you praise for gathering us together as you continue to call out from among the nations, O Lord, those who are called to be your people and to worship you forever. Send your angels and your Holy Spirit, O Lord, to gather your church together, that with one voice we might give you praise. We ask in the name of Jesus. Please be seated. If you too get your animals out to us at 657, so he has made me glad. Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. 
I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought nearly young. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their own fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat the produce. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not toil in vain, or, build ch or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their ancestors and their descendants with them. Before they cry, I will answer, and they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. I'm reading from Second Thessalonians. Now here is a command, dear brothers and sisters, given in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by his authority. Stay away from any Christian who spends his days in laziness and does not follow the ideal of hard work we set up for you. For you well know that you ought to follow our example. You never saw us loafing. We never accepted food from anyone without buying it. We worked hard day and night for the money we needed to live on in order that we would not be a burden to any of you. It wasn't that we didn't have the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to show you firsthand how you should work for your living. Even while we were still there with you, we gave you this rule, he who does not work shall not eat. Yet we hear from, uh, that from some of you are living in laziness, refusing to work, and waiting your time, wasting your time in gossiping. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we appeal to such people. We command them to quiet down, get to work, and earn their own living. And to the rest of you, I say, dear brothers, Never be tired of doing right. And now let's rise for the reading of the gospel. We've heard words how God is going to build a city. And we've heard words about how Christians are to labor. We are to labor for God's glory. And now we hear these words are kind of tough. Because this is about Jesus describing Jerusalem being toppled over. That all of our work is not about bricks and mortar, but about the people of God how God has called us to work to become his people. Listen to this reading from Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Some of Jesus' disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another, and every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things will happen first. But the end will come, not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from the heavens. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But wake up your mind not to worry, and worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by your parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. But not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And let us give thanks to God with hymn number 14.
was blessed to know her and, uh, and her daughter. <laughs> and I thank God for her. And, uh, even, even in sadness, God is merciful. Uh, she passed, uh, passed quietly. And Jesus knew her name. And yes, her yes name. indeed. Other phrases and words of thanksgiving to be thankful for. Sunday school teachers and our pastors that we've had 
all through the years. Um, also, as prayer request, some youth leaders from the 70s, Delphi Lewis and Karen Lewis. Karen Lewis passed um, Sunday. A few of you may remember her. The Lord in her. Any other things that you would like to praise God for? Yes. Um, my great grandma, right now, she need prayers for her because she fell out of her house and she's now in a hospital with a broken arm and shoulder and a black eye. And well, she's not in the hospital, she's in a um, um, rehab. So, can we get the man please get praise for her? Or prayers? Yes. All right. And we also give thanks for the Ward Me neighborhood and all that they are doing in revitalizing this neighborhood. Let's pray to the Lord. Oh, John Swain. Oh, go ahead, John. Sometimes the name of, applies to a person in more ways than one. The lady sat beside me, turned 99, her name Grace Goodnow. Yes. 99 years old. I mean, <laughs> she does something, she's done something a lot of people wish they could do. Yes. If, if ever a name applied to a person, Grace applies to her. And the scripture that if you live to 100, God, that is still young. God, we thank you for all the gifts that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for the mighty crop that you have produced through the fields and the farmers and all the people who, Lord, have brought in the harvest. And, Lord, for all the shipments that are going around the world to share that blessing with the nations. We thank you that you have brought the nations to us and to your church. And, Lord, we thank you in the many languages of the world how you have been faithful to provide for us safety and security. Lord, you know the winter storms that may arrive. You know, Lord, the safe places and the secure places that we seek out. And Lord, we pray for all of our neighbors. We thank you for the abundance of homes we have here in Topeka. And we pray for all those who are looking for homes, for those who are homeless. Lord, we pray for the tent city and for all who are there. That, Lord, you will bring blessings upon the nations. And that, Lord, you will help us establish the kingdom and see the kingdom come, which you are working in. Lord, we thank you for family, for great-grandmas, grandmas, grandparents, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, and Lord, we rejoice for even children yet to be born. Thank you for the friendships that you have given to us. Thank you for grace and those who have faithfully served through the generations in this congregation. Thank you for the pastors who have come before us. And Lord, preach your word that others might hear the good news and be saved. God, we pray for your word to continue to advance. That Lord, it will spread through among the nations and our neighborhoods and our homes and our schools. And Lord, that we will see the glory of your coming and your kingdom established within the cities. God, thank you for people with special gifts, those with special needs. People, Lord, who need you and those who provide that care. Thank you, Lord, for those who serve, not only in our military, and Lord, for those who serve the nations, but thank you for moms and dads who serve quietly, even secretly at home, and oftentimes struggle with encouragement. Lord, we pray that your spirit, your word, our cards will go forth to uplift and to bring joy to the hearts of your people. And God, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. Jesus, you said that we would be handed over to police, to judges, to kings, and to nations, and that, Lord, we will be your witnesses. And, Lord, we pray for all who are bearing witness to you today, in their testimony, in their words, in their prison sentences, in silence, and, Lord, even with their blood. Continue to help your persecuted church, O oh Lord. Help your church to grow, that we might see your kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. Lord, we have a lot of things to say thank you for. So between now and Thanksgiving and the days afterwards, Lord, help us be focused on your generosity, your giving, and your grace. For we ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our sinners. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
I invite our ushers forward to receive our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings as ways of expressing our thanksgiving to our God. We won't 
do that today. I know there are two workers in the nursery, and we'll add how many. And then on the north side of the church, which is the north side? Well, sometimes the ushers don't even know, but they're over there. <laughs> so come on over here, and let's count the number of people who are on this side. Come on. All right, we're going to count. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's nine, ten, eleven. Okay, there's eleven. Okay. Now count the number of people who are in the middle. Oh, this is a tough one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, all the way in the back way. Sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. And now on the south side. Let's count the south side. All right. Yeah. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you guys sit over there. Ten, eleven, twelve. All right, there's twelve. All right. And then we often have to count the other people. Because guess what? There are people who are sitting out there who need to be counted too. And I know at least two people who are out there. All right. And then we have to add all these persons up, and then they tell us how many are in worship. Whew. Now the next job is to count everybody in Topeka. <laughs> in town, everybody who lives in our city. 400, there's more than 400. 8,200. 8,000, oh please, Lord, 80,000 people? Wouldn't that be nice, right? That would really cut down on the traffic. You, can you guess even how many are in our neighborhood? 50? Well, there's more than 50 people. All right. 2,400 people just live around the church. Did you know that? 2,000 people just live around the church. And more than 140,000 people live in town. Actually, it's not a town anymore. It's a city. And that 100,000 mark is really important because we're getting ready to have the census. And you know what the census is? The act. That's when the government sends out people just like you guys, and you go door to door, and they count how many people live in every single house, every single street, and even in the tent city. They'll count the homeless people, right? How many people live in the dorms, at the college, everything on a particular day. And if you reach 100,000 people, guess what? That number is a special number because then you get to be a city. And Topeka is a city. And then they have to count everybody in Kansas, and then everybody in the United States. So do you want to go door to door to every person in the United States? Well, we don't go that far. We don't go. We allow other countries to count. <laughs> but this number, 100,000, is important, and you know why? Because God said He's going to be building a city, not just a little village, not a town. God is going to be building a city, a city so big. Guess what? Everyone has a place to live. A city so big, everyone gets health care. A city so big that everyone feels safe and that there's justice. Did you even think that you would live in a city? You guys are growing up in a city. Or at least some of you are growing up near a city because you guys live in the suburbs, but we still count you in Shawnee County, right? And I want you to remind you that, that cities matter to God. People matter to God. Children matter to God. God loves children. And did you know that God even loves the city? And so when we do the census and when the census report comes out, I want you to remember it's important. Because God loves every single person. Look out there. God loves every single person we just counted, including you. Can you remember that? God loves you and you count? Me. Me. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know every single person on this earth. And not only that, but you know every single hair that is on their head. And Lord, we thank you that people matter to you. People in small towns. People in villages, people who live out in the country, and Lord, you even even said, people who live in cities matter to you, even the people who live under the bridges. Lord, help us see that people matter to you, and they should matter to us too. In Jesus' name, amen. You may walk to Children's Church or back to your seats. But I think you guys all get to church, right? Yeah. So thank you for all the people here because 
you can. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your tremendous love, for all the grace that you give to us. And Lord, we thank you that you love the people who haven't even woke up yet to come to worship. Help us, O oh Lord, to love them too. In Jesus' name. This morning I want to start out with a simple straw poll. Uh, the question is very simple. How many of you grew up in rural areas, in small towns, or small villages? Any of you grew up out in the rural areas? Okay. And how many of you who grew up in rural areas thought you would grow up and live in a city? Whoa, 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 just see those hands again. Let's, that's quite the shocker. How many of you grew up in rural areas and small towns? Raise your hands high. And how many thought that they would live in a city? All right. That is amazing because as Americans, we often think of small towns. We talk about villages. We think of our rural communities that produce all of the grain and the wheat and the harvest. But how many of us truly value our cities? When we think of cities, we often think of what? Crime. Crime. All right. What else do you think of in cities? Pollution. Pollution. And? Poverty, corruption, pardon me? Traffic. Oh, good Lord, yes. I was wondering the other day where all the people came from who were blocking me in the roads when I was trying to get through. Yes. I remember moving from Chicago and down into a smaller town in southern Illinois, and the first thing that Maxine asked me to do was to go to, to go to Walmart. And I said, honey, I can't because it's after 4.30 and I'll go at 7 because there's rush hour traffic. And she chuckled and laughed and said, oh, honey, there's no rush hour traffic in this small town. <laughs> there was. It was from 5 to 5.15. And that was about it. And everyone thought, oh. When we think about living in cities, we often don't have positive views. We often don't think of, of them as being places of thriving, places of prosperity, places where people want to live. And yet when we look at the scriptures, we quickly realize that one of the first cities mentioned was the city of Enoch in Genesis chapter 4. That all of a sudden God begins to talk immediately after the creation stories about the people gathering. People gathering together, clustering together for services. We cluster together for support. We cluster together for education. We oftentimes gather together in what was the first major city after the city of Enoch? But the city in the Tower of Babel. That all of a sudden, within that first creation story where God tells us, go and populate the earth, what did we all do? We gathered together to build such a grand city that we would even reach the popularity and even the heights of heaven. And that is where the story is that God had to scatter us among the nations, confusing our languages, being able to disperse us, to fulfill the creation promise that we would dominate the earth and that there we would produce everything that we needed. And we think of two cities in the scriptures, we often realize that when the cities began to form, they saw exactly what we said. Corruption, places of poverty and problems of wickedness. We think about crime and murder. We even hear that in our own reports in the news. We often think of misjustice and police and courts being corrupt. And we often also think of what was traditionally understood as syncretic worship. That there are so many places of worship that people have a plethora of options, almost like a smorgasbord of services that they can attend. And let me assure you, Topeka has more places of worship than you can possibly imagine or even number. We think of homelessness, and we think oftentimes of our leaders, right? Our leaders being great people of ethics and prosperity, and people who do their jobs correctly, right? Oh my, we often don't have great views. Even this last week, when I had breakfast with our city manager, the questions came out for him, why isn't our city better? And he says to us all, why are you so critical and don't see the great things happening in this city? which even challenged me to begin to hear his recount of wonderful things happening. But oftentimes when we think of cities, we also think of blight. We think of issues of decay, places of poverty and abandonment. And when the people of God were beginning to think about the cities, they would often picture two cities. As Augustine would write in his great book, The City of God Against Those Who Are Pagans. 
And in his book from the 5th century, he would say, you can find throughout the biblical text two cities that are constantly compared against each other. One city that is robust, that is vibrant, that is bustling with commerce and justice. A cosmopolitan city where people intend to move because there is a great place to live. They get services and mixed nationalities. And when you stroll through the marketplaces, you, the air is saturated with the smell of spices from all over the world. Your ears hear the symphony of languages spoken in the nations of the world. And what do you see? Law and order. There is goodness. There is blessing. There is provence. And yet Augustine says, within the biblical world, you also see the other city, the city we often think about, the cities of crime and injustice and ruin. And what happens when we think about this, Augustine says, you hear within the text of Isaiah, a call that God is going to do something new. God is going to build a city, what? A city of blessing, a city of prosperity, even a city of peace. And when we look at the Isaiah text, we begin to discover that when he begins to speak within the destruction of Jerusalem, you see that God promises that even within disaster, there will be renewal. For remember, the people are coming back during the time of Isaiah. They're coming back during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, as we have been studying in Sunday school. And there is a promise that the city that has been destroyed, the city that has been burned, will once again grow. And here, some people think Isaiah is talking about a utopia, that somehow he's giving out a vision that will never come to earth. But here he begins to talk about Jerusalem, the city of God that will be filled with what? Sadness and sorrow? No. In verse 18, Jerusalem as a city of joy. We often don't think about that, do we? Cities filled during the holidays with musical spirit and prosperity. And there he begins to describe a people, a people who will be a people of delight. Not a people of blight, a people of delight and joy. And there will be rejoicing, and what will be absent in this city? Depression, grieving, mourning, and even short-term mortality. There will be no longer homelessness, but there will be a sense of charity as understood as altogether good. And he begins to describe a city that the people for the last 70 years have been longing for. A city where everyone has a home. Everyone is able to grow their own garden. A place where there's human rights. There is employment benefits. No longer human trafficking and worrying about that. And he would go on to say, even a city where there would be no more conflict and no more warfare. Wouldn't it be nice to have that type of city? To live in a city where your neighbors don't blow their leaves into your yard for you to pick up, but we pick up all our own leaves, and maybe even go into our neighbor's yard to pick up their leaves. A city where there's no more issues, that every child gets an education, and every place is a blessing. And as Isaiah begins to preach to the people about this, they begin to rejoice that somehow, with the blessing of God, this city could come to earth. And of course, they thought with their own hands, what would they do? They would build this city, as oftentimes we thought of in the 1950s and 60s. Through our own science, through our own hard work, through our own technology, we will make cities abound with prosperity. We will build roads and streets, and cars will be upon them, not thinking that there would be traffic, right? Rush hour traffic, or even congestion. We begin to dream through our sciences that somehow, through our own hands and our own work, there the city would be produced, and all the people would gather around the world to Jerusalem and bid it peace. And as they began to dream about this, they began to realize one thing. The city would not be built without God. And so during the time of Jesus and the Romans who had gone through country after country, conquering and establishing building. Jesus would share words of disparity. He would say to his disciples as they looked upon the grand temple and the adorned stones and beautiful work that somehow something was missing. And what was missing? The Spirit of God. Because we thought for a moment in Isaiah that God would build us bricks and mortar, that through institutions and establishment, through our own hands and 
what they say, gifts dedicated to God through plays and plaques on everything, that this was donated by so-and-so, that somehow all of this would fulfill our human hearts and our desires. And Jesus would give the words of warning. It's not about bricks. It's not about stone. And I even have to say it with caution, it's not even about boilers. It's about the kingdom of God. God promises, even through the testimony of Jesus, that God desires to build not just cities, but what? Community. Community that is established with relationships. People who have right relationships with one another, who enjoy one another, who receive blessings. And as the family of God is built and established on earth, what would happen? That there would be established a kingdom to come. All of a sudden, Jesus would remind us about, not about power, not about control, not that we would be in charge, but through our hard works of love and witness, we would be able to win over people to a new city being established. And all of a sudden, we would hear from Isaiah, again, a testimony in the book of Revelation, that God is building us a city where all these things will come to fruition, a city where everyone will be loved, Everyone will have their needs met. Everyone will be taken care of by health care. Everyone will be established with light and life and desire. And of course, the question the disciples would ask Jesus is, how do we get there? How do we get there? And the answer is, the kingdom of God. Oftentimes, as we talk about church and establishing churches in the world, we often think about bricks and mortar. We think about the neighborhood church. But one of the visions that God has is not just a building, but a neighborhood where people love each other and care about each other. And that's the vision I have for Award Me. We often have to ask, why in the world is Westside Baptist Church still here? Why has God called us into this neighborhood, into this community? A community that has a high single mother rate, where more than one-third of the children live in poverty with a single parent, where there is crime, where there is prostitution, where there is great need, but also where there are wonderful people and services to be had. And it has to do with this, my brothers and sisters, that when this church was first planted, people saw and heard the vision of God, that God is calling us together, not just to be a great church, but to be a great community. A great neighborhood where justice is established by the establishing and sharing of the love and message of Jesus Christ. And as John would pick up Isaiah's text in the book of Revelation, the church would wonder, how do we get there? And how do we get there? By our loyalty and our love to Jesus. One of the things I think our neighborhood needs the most is love. There are a lot of people in the Ward Mean neighborhood who are simply wondering, does anyone care about me? Does anyone know that I have needs? And the answer is what? Yes, we know. And we will get there, not by our own strength, but we do need to work, as Paul would say. Those who do not work do not eat. But more than that, we have a call and a vision to bring and establish the good news of the gospel here. And that is only done through the work of God. We can have great programs, we can have a great educational system, but if we don't have the Spirit and the Word of the Lord spreading through God's people into homes and houses and into people's hearts, nothing we do will change this neighborhood. But if we do follow the kingdom of God and hear the call of God's reform, God's call to repentance, and God's call to renewal, God will do amazing things. There are a number of people in the neighborhood who have told me as I walk through the streets and visit them, this church is their church home. I always laugh at that because I never see them here in worship. <laughs> I hardly ever see them serving on Wednesday nights. But they have considered this their church home. And why? Because they see here everything the desire in the kingdom of God. People who love, people who are willing to like each other, people who are willing to serve. And my brothers, that's what stewardship is all about. It's not about money. It's about giving. Giving our hearts, our time, our energy to the vision that God has given us. A neighborhood renewed.
by God and His law. And if each church, and if each ch neighborhood would do that in our nation, our nation and our world would be transformed. Amen? Amen. So when we think about stewardship next week, and we think about all that we are giving to, I hope that you're not just giving to a building where you can put your name on. Because if we're all concerned about just this building, someday it will be empty. But if we are concerned about our neighborhood and the mission that God has called us to love each other and spread His love to others, I'm certain this church will be fine when the neighborhood is renewed. Amen? Amen. So Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have called us here to be a people of thanksgiving. And we give You thanks for our neighbors, single moms, all the children who are quite rambunctious and don't know the rules. Lord, we give You thanks for our neighbors who are unemployed, who are looking for work and need our help. Lord, we thank you for our neighbors who are disabled, those who are asking us for help, those who are coming here for help, and those, Lord, who are volunteering to help us, even, Lord, if they don't join us on Sunday mornings. Lord, we thank you for our government, those who have placed in authority. We thank you for our police and our firefighters. We thank you for our neighborhood renewal committee, the neighborhood improvement committee, and the leaders. And we thank you for the thousands of dollars that you have invested in streets and sidewalks and in programs. Lord, hear our prayers, that most of all, that Lord, we pray for your spirit, that through your word and through the preaching of your word and through your spirit, every neighbor might know about Jesus and your kingdom to come. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, come. Establish your kingdom, your kingdom of heaven, on earth. In Jesus' name. And how do we do it? We do it together. I am not going to be able to renew this neighborhood by itself. And there's no way in God's free earth I would be able to renew a church by itself. It is the work of us together through the unity of the Holy Spirit. So join me as we sing our closing song, song number 12, Be Exalted, O God. That God can renew the earth through His church and through His mission and through His spirit.
Thank you.